The study of Kabbalah is perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of Western esotericism. Texts often only make sense in Hebrew or in Aramaic. They presuppose an enormous amount of rabbinical and biblical lore. The dialectical style of argumentation they employ is often genuinely perplexing, and these texts speak in layers of code and allegory that's very, very difficult to decode. And further, attempts to simplify Kabbalah and to wikipedia sized chunks frankly destroys exactly what makes Kabbalah so interesting, its incredible complexity and dynamism. Frankly, the study of Kabbalah is difficult, and simplification simply evade the task at hand. With this problem in mind, I'm sometimes asked for a kind of progressive study guide for studying Kabbalah, and by the time I've gotten a few texts in, I've realized I've reproduced the exact problem all over again. It's just become a long list of texts and commentaries. So this naturally raises the question, how did the medieval and renaissance masters of Kabbalah, well, learn Kabbalah? How did they arrange the text to learn it the way that they did? Just what text did they study, in what order, with what commentaries? What Jewish and non-Jewish sources did they use to learn Kabbalah? Just what text did they study, and in what order, with what commentaries? One wonders to what degree did non-Jewish texts feature into their education? How did Kabbalists, well, become Kabbalists? In this episode of Esoterica, I want to explore a Kabbalistic study program from Renaissance Italy. It was composed by Yohanan Alameno, a rather obscure but very important Kabbalist, especially through his student, Giovanni Pico della Morandola, who basically invented Christian Kabbalah as we know it in the writing of his 900 Theses. Alameno's study guide is fascinating because of his priority of ecstatic, prophetic Kabbalah over the more typical theosophical schools associated with the Sefer Zohar. And further, what makes this Kabbalah really interesting is his linking with both magical theory and practice with the Kabbalah. So if you're interested in studying Kabbalah, especially Christian and Hermetic Kabbalah, I hope you'll join me as we turn to Yochanan Alameno's Renaissance Kabbalah Study Guide. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. Yohanan Alameno lived in one of the most exciting periods in the history of Western esotericism. He saw the completion of Ficino's translation of the Corpus Hermeticum and lived during the period of a kind of neo-hermetic renaissance, led by people like Lodovico Lazzarelli, one of the first persons to actually call themselves a hermeticist. He tutored and worked alongside Giovanni Pico della Mirandola as he studied Kabbalistic text in the original Hebrew and Aramaic, and of course in translations by the very colorful Flavius Mithridates and the more sober Elijah del Mendigo. Alamano himself developed a form of Kabbalah in which ecstatic prophecy and magic feature prominently, and in this way he's a bit of a forerunner for the development of Hermetic Kabbalah and European occultism more generally. For a glimpse into this more Hermetic or occult notion of Kabbalah found in Yohanan Alamano, I want to turn to his study guide found in a document called the Likutim, which is basically a kind of notebook filled with stray thoughts, edited together by Moshe Idel. This guide is a progressive study program beginning at age four and progressing to more and more abstract and magical texts as one grows older. The goal of the guide is Hatzacha and Noshit, which literally means something like human success, but we can probably better translate it as a version of Udaimonia, that is to say, human flourishing. So in Alameno's guide, one begins at the age of four and through the progress of studying more and more difficult texts, ultimately ending with magical texts, one can achieve something like human flourishing, the ideal life for the human being. Thus, the guide represents a study program for someone who wants to flourish not only as a Kabbalist, but more generally as a human being, progressing through basic grammar all the way to wielding magical powers. The Kabbalistic study guide begins as one might imagine. From the ages of 4 to 13, Alameno tells us that one should learn to read the Bible in the original Hebrew, although with no commentaries. This is in addition to learning to read and write Hebrew, along with one's vernacular language and other languages, and I think he has in mind here perhaps Latin and even Greek. In addition, toward the end of this cycle, closer to the age of 13, the traditional age of one's bar mitzvah, 
Alameno also tells us that one should begin to study the Mishnah with the commentaries of Maimonides. The Mishnah, as you may know, is a collection of rabbinical lore that was collected in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple and edited together sometime around 200 of the Common Era. The rabbinical commentary on the Mishnah becomes the massive volumes known as the Talmud, the core text of rabbinical Judaism. The next seven years, from ages 13 to 20, are dedicated, at least in part, to studying the Talmud, and of course this makes a great deal of sense. Many people often forget that even the most basic text of the Kabbalah presuppose that one has already studied the Bible in great depth in Hebrew, along with the vast sea of rabbinical literature. Further, it's during this period that Alameno also recommends that one begin to study language in a much greater detail during this period, and this is specifically a reference to the study of rhetoric and logic. This includes classical texts in logic and rhetoric by Aristotle, along with their commentaries by Averroes. These are typical texts in the medieval education system, and what's interesting is that in the Kabbalistic study guide, these non-Jewish texts are featured just alongside other Jewish texts as crucially important for the development of the budding Kabbalist. It's also during this period from ages roughly 13 to 20 that Alameno recommends that we begin to dedicate ourselves to the study of mathematics and geometry, and further to the study of astrology and astronomy. So it seems that by the age of 20, Alameno has in mind that one should have a very solid grasp of the Bible and the original Hebrew, along with various languages, logic and rhetoric, mathematics, and astrology astronomy. Clearly, Alameno is recommending that we set for ourselves a very firm logical foundation before we turn to more abstract topics like metaphysics, mysticism, and magic. The next seven years, from ages 20 to 27, seem specifically dedicated to more abstract topics in the history of philosophy. Here we're told by Alameno to study the physics and metaphysics of Aristotle, likely with the commentaries, of course, of Averroes. It's also interesting that Alameno urges us to get a dose of political philosophy during this time period, with the study of both Plato and Al-Ghazali. Again, it's interesting that during this time period we'll be studying more abstract metaphysical ideas, the study of political philosophy is perhaps meant to be more grounding. Though it is in this third cycle that we begin to turn toward more metaphysical and specifically mystical concepts in the study guide. Here Alameno tells us that if we're interested in the concept of conjunction, or devekut in Hebrew, we should turn to texts that deal with that subject. Interestingly, all three texts that he recommends are by Muslim writers. What exactly does Alameno mean by conjunction, or devekut, in the study guide? Of course, this word literally means to cling to, and in later Hasidic thought it has the idea of clinging to God, but of course Hasidism is several hundred years in the future of Alameno. So we have to locate the idea of conjunction, or devekut, specifically in his 15th century context. Here, it seems to mean the idea of one's intellect soaring up through the various spheres of the cosmos to unite with what is at that time called the active intellect. Of course, the concept of the active intellect is one of the most complicated ideas in all of the Middle Ages, and it has the connotation of being something like the mind of God, or the mind of the universe, which contains a kind of pure intellection itself. In fact, Maimonides had argued that prophecy itself was something like a kind of spiritual purification, where one's mind becomes united with the active intellect. So it's here in Alameda's study guide that we pass from mere intellectual studies to pure intellection itself, perhaps divine intellection. Again, what's interesting about this process is that the books that Alameno recommends for beginning the process of passing from mere intellectual studies to conjunction or devekut with the divine intellect or the active intellect, that the texts he recommends are by Muslim writers, not Jewish ones. What's fascinating to me about this is that Alameno seems to be comfortable recommending the truth wherever he can find it. It doesn't seem that he really cares that the writers here are Muslim or Christian or pagan. For him, what matters is the truth and if the first stage in the process of uniting one's intellect with the active or divine intellect are to be found best in Muslim writers, he recommends them. It's also worth noting that during this time period, from roughly the ages of 20 to 27, that Alameno recommends that one begin to study medicine and alchemy. He specifically recommends the very famous alchemical text, the Turbo Philosophorum, and he also says that one should learn to begin to use the Alembic. Of course, learning to use the Alembic would allow you to engage in both alchemical experimentation, but also, of course, distillation is a very important part of the production of medicines. So from the ages of 20 to 27, one has begun to engage in much more abstract philosophical speculation, passing from one's own intellect to the active intellect, and also here one begins to engage in alchemical and medical studies as well. 
During the next seven years of the development of the Kabbalist and Alamino study guide, one greatly intensifies one's study of metaphysical concepts. During this period, we're told to study the great classics of medieval philosophy, which at that time would still be relatively fresh. This would include the Incoherence of the Philosophers by Al-Ghazali, and the Reply, the Incoherence of the Incoherence by Ibn Rushd, along with the Guide of the Perplexed by Maimonides, along with the Kuzari of Halevi. Further, we're also told that we should study the great attack on Aristotelian metaphysics led by Chastai Kreskas in his famous book, Or Hashem. And this is also the time period where we study the great medieval biblical commentaries by Rashi, Gersonides, Ibn Ezra, and Nachmanides. It's worth noting that the commentaries recommended by Alameno represent a wide range of Jewish approaches to understanding the biblical text, from radical rationalists in the person of someone like Gersonides, all the way to something much more mystical like someone like Nachmanides. Of course, Nachmanides' biblical commentary basically established the legitimacy of the Kabbalah in the Jewish world. Further, we also have the kind of polemics between Al-Ghazali and Halevi, along with the debate at some level between the more Aristotelian ideas of Maimonides and the more Neoplatonic ideas of Halevi and the Kuzari. It seems that what Alamena wants to cultivate is our ability to understand both sides of a debate, the more mystical and the more rational, the more Aristotelian and the more Neoplatonic. Here he seems to be inculcating in us the idea that in order to do metaphysics we have to be able to think critically and not dogmatically. By studying both sides of these traditions we gain just those skills. It is also during this time period, in the most holy months of the year, the months of Tishrei and Nisan, the months of Passover and the High Holidays, that one begins to study the works of classical Kabbalah. Here we're told to study the intensely mystical biblical commentary of Menachem Rakanti, a text that will have a very important impact on Pico. The works of the ecstatic mystic Abraham Abulafia, who developed a form of prophetic Kabbalah in which one meditates on the divine name in order to achieve union with the divine along with the Sefer Yetzirah and its commentaries. Of course, the Sefer Yetzirah is one of the most mysterious books in Kabbalah and describes the creation of reality, and perhaps the golem, through the use of the Sefirot in the Hebrew alphabet. Of course, the Sefer Yetzirah is one of the most difficult books in all of Jewish mysticism, despite its brevity, and when it's printed, it's often printed with dozens of commentaries. The commentaries actually represent sometimes 95% of the bulk of a printed version of the Sefer Yetzirah, to give you an idea of just how difficult this text can be. It's also tremendously important to note what's missing in Alameno's study guide. There's no reference to studying the Sefer Zohar, typically thought to be the very backbone of the Kabbalah itself. While it's indeed shocking that there's no mention of the Sefer Zohar in Alameno's study guide, this should point us to the fact that there have always been several different competing schools, many mutually exclusive schools, of the Kabbalah. There's never been one Kabbalah. There have always been multiple schools of Kabbalah, and here we have the priority on the more ecstatic prophetic Kabbalah rather than the more classical theosophical Kabbalah that most of us now understand as, well, the Kabbalah. Of course, the shift from theosophical Kabbalah to ecstatic prophetic Kabbalah is going to have huge ramifications in the development of both Christian Kabbalah and, by extension, Hermetic Kabbalah. As you may know, in the theosophical Kabbalah, and this is a Kabbalah primarily interested in the world of the divine emanations, or the Sephirot, the task of the mystic is to metaphysically repair reality through scrupulous adherence to Jewish law, or halakha. Obviously, the centrality of Jewish law and the theosophical schools of Kabbalah are simply not going to mesh very well with Christianity. By shifting their focus to ecstatic or prophetic forms of Kabbalah, Christian and later Hermetic Kabbalists are able to decouple the centrality of Jewish law from the very mystical form of Judaism itself. Of course, this conception of Kabbalah is utterly unimaginable to the writers of something like the Zohar, but just because someone else can't imagine it doesn't mean it can't be done. Once this shift in focus was achieved, the Sephiroth themselves could be reabsorbed back into this new form of Kabbalah, although significantly changed from the way that they appear in the Zohar. While in the Zohar, the Sephiroth themselves are constantly changing, their systems of relation always in flux, in the later forms of Kabbalah, they're stabilized, and these stabilized sephirot are the ones that are going to appear in later Christian and later Hermetic ideas about Kabbalah. Of course, this understanding of the sephirot basically reflect a Renaissance Neoplatonic way of grasping the sephirot themselves as kind of divine Platonic forms. And in some sense, to this day, much of Christian Hermetic Kabbalah keeps at a certain distance the more theosophical ideas of Kabbalah found in the Zohar. One could argue, and many contemporary Kabbalists do make this argument, that the Sephirot and the Zohar are dynamic, while the later system of the Sephirot are rather fossilized. 
Of course, it's only with the stabilization or fossilization of the Sephirot, depending on how you want to look at it, that's going to greatly influence Christian and Hermetic Kabbalah, because it's only if those entities are stable that they can, for instance, be put into very complex systems of correspondence the way that you see in modern occultism. Again, this is only possible with static, unchanging Sephirot, which again are not to be found in the Zohar. In the Zohar, one's adherence to the Jewish law actually changes the configuration of the Sephirot themselves. Here it's very important to observe that Alemano is acting something like a bridge between the exclusively Jewish Kabbalah, whether it be the ecstatic Kabbalah of Abu Lafia or the theosophical Kabbalah of the Zohar, to the Christian idea of Kabbalah decoupled from its adherence to Jewish law to be found in something like Pico, and by extension the development of those Kabbalistic theories into what is now called Hermetic Kabbalah in the modern period. In a very strong sense, if you're a non-Jewish person who uses Kabbalah as part of your mystical practice, you can basically thank Yohanan Alameno for opening that door. Finally, at the end of the study guide, we actually reach the apex of what Alameno takes to be, in some sense, the goal of the entire process itself. It is here that we encounter the combination of both Kabbalah and magic. Here we're told that if we wish to pursue Chokmat Haruchoneyut, this is a term that means something like spiritual science or spiritual wisdom, although in this case, Alameno seems to mean it as something like the combination of Kabbalah and magic. We're told to study a host of texts that we would now recognize as magical textbooks or grimoires. Some of these texts that jump out are among the most famous grimoires to be found in the medieval world. Here we have a reference to the Sefer Raziel, the Tachlit HaChacham, and the Almendel. Of course, the Sefer Raziel is perhaps one of the most famous Jewish grimoires of the Middle Ages and exists in several manuscripts. It focuses primarily on amulets with a very strong dose of astrological magic. The Taklit HaKakam is simply a Hebrew translation of the Goal of the Wise, better known in Europe as the Picatrix, which of course is a vast encyclopedia of magic ranging on an enormous amount of topics. Further, a mention here is also made of the Al Mandel. This is also a text that survives in several Jewish translations, and this text deals with a kind of magical apparatus for the summoning of various spirits. Of course, this text will go on to great fame, directly influencing Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly in their Enochian scrying sessions but would also be edited together with several other texts, including the Goetia, as part of the Lesser Key of Solomon, perhaps the most influential textbook in magic and occultism today. So it's very interesting that in the culmination of Alameno's study program, we're given a very clear admonition to study magic, and not simply any form of magic, a wide variety of magical practices, from summoning spirits to astrological magic to talismanic magic. Here it seems that for Alameno, human success and human flourishing is possible in some sense only through the use of magic. So as we can see, Yohanan Alameno's study guide for Hatzacha and Noshit, or human flourishing, includes a wide range of human intellectual efforts, all the way from the very basics of reading and writing and grammar to the accomplishment of magical feats through various kinds of magical texts. And his combination of Kabbalah and magic is basically pioneering in European occultism. In a very substantial way, his influence through Pico basically lays the groundwork for European occultism. And his study guide is, in a very strong sense, a predictor for the trajectory of European occultism, beginning of course with Pico, but extending into Agrippa and John Dee, and later into modern occultism, all the way to the contemporary period. One might even say that Alamino's study guide is something like Western occultism in microcosm. If you're interested in the history of magic, Kabbalah, or occultism, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica. These are all core contents of our channel. If you want to support my work of making accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in Western esotericism here on YouTube, please consider supporting my work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Your support really does make Esoterica possible. If you'd like to consult Alamino's study guide yourself, you can find it in Appendix 3 of Moshe Adel's really wonderful book on the history of Kabbalah in Italy. This volume is just really wonderful in general if you're interested in the development of Christian Kabbalah or the development of hermetic ideas in their intersection with Kabbalah in Renaissance Florence or Italy more generally. The book not only translates Alamino's study guide into English for the first and only place that I think that it has appeared, but also there's an entire chapter just on Alamino and his interesting version of Kabbalah, which combines both magic and Jewish mysticism. I'll also say that Moshe Adel has also written a deeper investigation of the study guide itself rather than the, just the notes that we have in the Appendix 3 of his book. However, the article that does that deep dive into the study guide is in modern Hebrew, so you'll need to be able to read that language if you want to really deep dive into the study guide itself. Regardless, Adel's study of Kabbalah in Italy is one of the best books on the development of Christian Kabbalah at that time, although I will say that it's a little bit more advanced, so if you want an introduction to Kabbalah, you'll probably want to look somewhere else. 
However, if you do have a little bit of Kabbalah under your belt, Idel's study of the development of that mysticism in Italy is a wonderful text to consult. So if you're interested in Kabbalah and magic, I hope you'll stay tuned. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.